Okay, in this video, we're going to go over chapter one in our textbook, which covers numbers and the base 10 system. So the beginning here tells you which of the uh, mathematical content and mathematical practice standards we're going to be covering. So counting numbers are where we start. So counting numbers are what you assume they are. You count starting one, two, three, four. They're also called natural numbers and they can be uh, represented by the letter N. Now, notice something about counting numbers. They do not include a zero, because technically, when you talk about counting, you would not count a zero. We will talk about zero, because it's very, very important, a little later on in the video, when we talk about whole numbers. So getting back to counting numbers, counting numbers can be thought of as an ordered list, so that's one way to think about them, and a second way is an indicator of how many objects are in a set. Okay, counting the numbers in a set connects these two views by making a one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, sometimes kids don't get this right away, but that's um, what is nice about our number system is that it does give you the one-to-one -one correspondence uh, between the initial portion of the list of counting numbers and the objects in the set. The last number spoken is the number of objects present. And again, this is a, a learned thing. Um, as st students are counting, they don't necessarily realize right away that if they're counting five teddy bears, when they say one, two, three, four, five, the last number they say is the, the number of teddy bears that are present. So that's something that needs to be reinforced over and over again. Okay, the base 10 system, which is what we use, allows us to write every counting number using only uh, these 10 digits. Oops, these 10 digits right here. Uh, it uses place value, which means that the number, that the value that a digit in a number represents depends on the location of the digit in the number. Each place has the value of a base 10 unit, and base 10 units are created by repeated bundling by 10. Okay, so this is a lot of adult talk. Each base 10 unit is the value of a place, and the value of a place is 10 times the value of the place to its immediate right. Okay, this is a cute video on counting, and our textbook also talks about how um, the Roman system of creating different symbols for different numbers, different increasing numbers, got very cumbersome, and how our system is a nice replacement to that. Um, it also talks about, uh, it also gives you class activities in the back of the book. These are valuable, and they certainly could be used in your interactive notebook because you're going to do four pages for each chapter. So you can think about how you want to work on that um, by looking at some of the videos I've included in this PowerPoint and in your notes, and also in the uh, counting activities and other activities for chapter one that you'll find in the back of the textbook. So speaking about activities and videos, here are some more on base 10. Uh, math Antics is always a good video to go to for information on how to present this to your class. Then I went in and I found some neat activities. They're colorful, and this is all from um, NCTM, uh, National Council of Teachers of Math. And those are very good. They're colorful. They're informative. Uh, there's some games included with this. So this uh, you can use as a game. It can be used with spinners, dice, or number generators. And dynamic paper is another good thing. You can do it and then uh, use it to create a template which you can print out for your class. Um, another good one is the Octas Rescue right here. That's also NCTM. These are all free activities that I have given you these links to. And here you are rescuing a given number of octopus. So the directions are included and it's a nice fun game. It's very colorful. You could also do screenshots of those and do that as an activity in classes as well or put it in the interactive notebook. And here are just some more interactive notebook ideas on base 10. 
You can find more ideas also on Pinterest, on Google, on different math blogs. It's a good idea to become familiar with all of these because they are great resources for you and you can share them with each other. You can share them when you're in a school with your other teachers and build a whole collection. And it works out very well. You're not spending a lot of money on it. And they are great um, activities, great ideas, and great um, eye catches because of the color. Okay, as we go into section 1.2 on decimals and negative numbers, I would recommend that you watch this overview video. Um, the guy is sometimes a little dry, but he does have a good discussion about zooming in on a number line and also of negative numbers, so you may find it uh, worthwhile to see him. He also has a lot of other uh, videos out, so you may see him over and over again in our course. So decimals are the names for the values of the places to the right of the one place. They're uh, symmetrically related to the names of the values of the places to the left of the one place. Re really, really important. Do not confuse tens with tenths, with the TH, and hundredths, hundreds with hundredths, okay? So if we say uh, we have a number, so let's say we have uh, two, three, point seven, five. Okay, this is the tens, ones, but then this is the tenths, and this is the hundredths. Okay, so just make sure that you are clear on that and make sure that your kids are clear on that. So you can see I have uh, tenths here. There's one decimal mark you can barely see, but it's there. Hundredths, you have two places after the decimal. Thousandths, three places after the decimal. Um, sometimes kids get confused with the tenths and the ones since the tens are over here. So one place behind a decimal place, a decimal uh, point, is a tenths location, but two places to the left is a tens location. Um, and they give you some of our cultural convention for saying uh, the word and when you have a decimal. So we can say this is 23 and 75 hundredths. So that's how we would say it in our culture. Okay, now our text move, book moves into negative numbers, and a negative sign in front of a number indicates that its placement is to the left of the zero on a number line. So here's your zero on the number line, and we say that um, the number zero is neither positive nor negative, and um, that's true for our course here, but know that as you get higher in math, um, some courses would view zero as a um, positive or an even number. So there's other ways to classify zero as you get higher up. But clearly it's always going to be neither positive nor negative. And then there'll be other classifications as we get higher in math. So negative three is going to tell me that I'm going to start, I can start at zero, and I'm going to go one, two, three spots to the left. And that takes me to negative three. So if you start to introduce it as the concept of negatives as a movement to the left, that's a good way to speak about it. So we haven't really talked about whole numbers as being a set, but whole numbers start with zero and they're all positive. Now we talk about integers right here. Okay, integers are, the symbol for integers is a Z and they are all the numbers on the large hash marks. Okay, so it includes all the counting numbers, which is one, two, three, four. It includes the zero, which is um, an indicator of having nothing. And then we include the numbers to the left of zero. And zero, uh, positive and negative numbers are placed symmetrically with respect to zero. So if you're at negative one, you're one hash mark to the left. If you're at positive one, you're one hash mark um, to the right. So you can kind of view you know, the symmetry of um, our bodies being similar to the symmetry of the uh, number line. So the center uh, would be your spinal column, and that center is zero. And then you have numbers that are positive to the right and numbers that are negative to the left. 
Okay, now an older grade school um, con uh, concept is having decimals that go on and on forever. So they have an infinite number of non-zero entries. So an example of that are the irrational numbers pi. So pi, you've probably seen, it's this. And then e, which just looks like e. Okay, these numbers uh, go on forever and ever. So for example, frequently uh, pi is represented as 2.14 but then you would say dot 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 to indicate that the numbers go on they do not end and they do not repeat okay so that's an irrational number so some of this will be above your grade level that you're teaching but it's nice to know where you're going so that if set if number if they say to you can you ever have a number that never stops and you can say yep absolutely that's an irrational number is an example of one that doesn't stop because it doesn't repeat and it doesn't end. Okay, there's another one, and numbers that are decimals that do repeat can be represented using bar notation. So, uh, for example, the fraction one third is actually 0.3 bar notation, which means it's 0.33333 on and on. Okay, all numbers with decimals can be represented as a point on the number line. Um, so. So you can represent the approximation of it, but because these uh, decimal points go on and on, you're never going to be exactly um, at the spot. So you never can find pi on a number line, but you can get to have an approximation of where it would be. Okay, so that's an important thing to note too, that the number line doesn't include all values. You have numbers that go on forever, um, and the numbers that go on forever and don't repeat, and they really can't be pre placed precisely there. This little number line is awfully cute also, and it uh, talks about, or I guess it shows what Dr., I think his name is Dr. Dove Math, was talking about zooming in, because here, the top one, you can see that you have some tenths, and then if you were to zoom in on, say, between 1.3 and 1.8, up on this number line, so you know somewhere in in this window, then you would have this one, and you can expand it a little bit, and that will include hundredths. And if you did the same thing and just zoomed in and expanded it, it can, could include thousandths. So anyway, that's how number lines work, and um, number lines are a great way to physically represent how our number system uh, works to little ones. And here's just another picture of a number line. And um, you can use you know, the frog concept of movement along the number line. So for example, if you were at negative five, so say you were right here, and you were gonna move one, two, three, four, five, six spots to your right, you'd be at one. And you can do this you know, on um, a large piece of paper on the floor, or even on a rug on the floor. Um, just this movement will give the kids an idea of, um, of where these numbers fall on the number line. Um, the color, the blue being positive, and the red being negative, and the zero being bold, helps them differentiate also between the different components of the number line. Okay, I'm just really touching the surface of this concept with this, this note packet and this video. So I do encourage you to go and look at the class activities as well because these are clearly very fundamental um, concepts that are very important to totally grasp and have creative ways of sharing that information with your students. Um, for our course, there's gonna be a um, homework packet. It'll be on chapter one and chapter two, so I'll be posting that along with these, this information um, today. So comparing numbers in base 10, so comparing non-negative numbers by viewing them as amounts. So a non-negative number, you can compare. A strict inequality means that there's no um, equal sign. So A is less than B. So for example, I can say five is less than seven. Okay, A is greater than B. So seven is greater than five. And there's all kinds of fun activities using, um, you know, alligator mouths. The alligator always eats the bigger number, or his nose always points to the smaller number. There's lots of ways to help your students and you 
uh, remember which way is which. So understanding why we can compare numbers the way we do. So in the base 10 system, that place value is hugely important. The kids have to have a good handle on that. So um, let's see how to compare non-negative numbers in the base 10 system. Start with the place of largest value represented in the numbers, the leftmost place. Compare the digits of both numbers in that place. So let's say that we're looking at 57 and 52. So if you start with the highest, that would be the 50s, and you would say just looking there that we cannot tell if they are um, equal, because right now they both have five tens in that tens position. So we can't totally decide. So then go to the next spot, and this is the next and only spot, and we have a 7, which is greater than the 2, and therefore we could say that 57 has to be greater than 52. So comparing the 10s digit didn't do it, but comparing then the 1s digit did uh, allow us to make that distinction. Okay, and you can do the same thing with A's and B's. So if you, you know, create a number line, so let's say this is my 0, and I have a 1, and I have a 2, and I have a 3. And then if you were to put two letters on your number line, so let's say I, I put my A over here and my B over here, because of the location on the number line, I'd be able to make a statement that A is less than B because B is further to the right, or I can say that B is greater than A because A is further to the left. So we can talk about abstract concepts, A's and B's, that will open the door to algebra, or you can talk about numbers depending on the age level of your students. So then given these number lines, it's important that your students understand that going to the right on a number line, the quantities will increase, and going to the left, the quantities will decrease. So the top number line are all positive digits. They have the single digits in red, and they have the, the double digits or the tens up to 20 in blue, and the movement from left to right goes to greater numbers. Okay, so the bottom number line has negative integers. So negative 20 is less than negative 9 because of movement. So that movement concept, moving from the left to the right, extends to the negative portion of the number line. And that's an important point to make because that may be confusing. Because when you see a 20, that is to the right of, say, 1. Therefore, 20 is greater, but a negative 20 is to the left of negative 1, and therefore negative 1 is actually greater than negative 20. And that's a confusing concept when you first introduce it. Okay, when you start talking about comparing negative numbers, one way to view them um, is as like money owed, so that's one concept. So the more you owe, <laughs> the less, therefore, you have. So if you owe um, negative 20, that's you have less than if you owe negative 2. So you can kind of play around with that in a, you know, a grocery store scenario with borrowing money from the grocery attendant and all those things. So here's the number line again. Here is also some good worksheets on comparing numbers. Um, the alligator picture is in the second one, um, greater than, less than circles. So they're easy things. They're very visual. They're very colorful. This is another example of one here. And then in the circle, you indicate whether it's you know, greater than or less than. It's more and more practice of using that symbol because um, that takes a while to totally grasp onto. So I pulled this, um, this little chart up so you can see it in its totality. And I just wanted to make a point about, you know, uh, placement is so important in understanding the concept of, of counting. So you can see that the three tens would always be placed to the left of the single one. 
because you wouldn't want to do it the other way. Even though you would count it the same way, that would be confusing and wouldn't be reinforcing for the kids. So here you're going to have 31, and then if I count, I have four tens, and I have four ones. So in this case, 31 is less than 44, and that's how you would group it. If you had hundreds, you'd be you know, grouping 10 sets of tens. So anyway, that placement concept is very, very important. So be careful how you set things up so that you're always reinforcing that. Okay, section 1.4 talks about rounding. And rounding is something that um, your students will work with all through high school, all through college, or really all through life. And there are right ways to round things, and there are wrong ways, and there are different rules in place given different scenarios. Okay, so when we try to decide how to round numbers, it's we're deciding which is the last digit to keep. So it says leave it the same if the next digit is less than five. This is called rounding down, but increase it by one if the next digit is five or more, and this is called rounding up. And um, different schools, different school systems teach this different ways. But uh, basically, if I had, let's say, if I had the number um, 15.45, and I wanted you to round that um, to the nearest 10, okay? So round to the nearest 10, I would say, oh, okay, 1 is my tenths position. I would look behind it, and since... I have a five, I'm going to round up. So I would say if I take 15.45 and round it to the nearest tenth, it would be 20. Okay, they gave the example here. Round 74 to the nearest tenth. So you want to keep the seven. Um, it's in the tenth position. The next digit is four, which is less than five. So no change is needed to the seven. Okay, so your answer is going to be 70 there. Because my next digit was greater than 4, it was 5, here I had to round up. So they rounded down, this got rounded down, I rounded up. So here's another example, round 86 to the nearest digit, we want to keep the 8. And the next digit is 6, which is 5 or more, so increase the 8 by 1. So when I tell kids to round, I tell them, okay, if you're going to round to the nearest 10, underline that, because we're going to look behind it to know what to do next. So behind it was greater than 5, so the, the 8 goes up. Now you have to say 90, you have to have a holding value there. So that's how the zero comes to comes in play. Okay, so that's rounding to the nearest 10. Okay, another word on rounding. So you can assume that numbers probably have been rounded. So for example, if a number is reported as 6.2, uh, most likely it's been rounded to the nearest 10th. Okay, it's important to uh, round you know, realistically, round your answer so that it does not appear to be more accurate than it actually is, and that's a measurement thing that would be uh, discussed probably in the higher grades. Okay, we're going to talk about rounding decimals um, on uh, the next slide. Okay, so first, when you round decimals, first uh, work out which number will be left when we finish. So rounding to the tenths, for example, means that we're going to leave one number after the decimal point. Okay, so if you had um, the number like, I don't know, 3.7824, and I said round to the nearest tenth. So what I would have my students do is underline this position, look behind. Since you see that you have an 8 that's greater than 5, you're going to round up, and you would get 3.8. Eight. That is 3.7824 rounded to the nearest tenth. Okay, so here is an example rounded to, the, to hundredths. So hundredths, I would have underlined the four. Okay, underline right there with the four. Look behind it, it's less than five. You hold, and 3.14 
is going to be rounded, what the answer is rounded to the nearest hundredth. So thousandths, you're going to have three decimal points uh, visible and only three. So you look, you look at the one because that's your thousandths spot. Look behind it as a six, you round up. Your final answer is 3.142 or three and 142 thousandths. Okay, this number rounded to the nearest tenth drops all the way down to 1.3. Okay, the seven is what did it because the seven behind the two is greater than five, I had to round up. Okay, so rounding is an important concept. Okay, so there, there are some problems though that rounding has to take into consideration the scenario. So let's say you are figuring out how many buses to order for your students and you come up with 5.4 buses. Well, that's a nice number rounded to the nearest tenth. However, that's not going to do it because no company is going to give you 5.4 buses. So here, it would make more sense to round that number up to the nearest whole number so that you'd be ordering six whole buses. So sometimes the storyline um, controls what you're going to round your number to. And on the last page of notes, they talk about rounding whole numbers. So if you run around to the tens, the hundredths, etc., you need to replace the removed digits with a zero. Okay? So if you have um, 134.9 rounded to the tens, you wouldn't call it 13, okay? That doesn't make sense because you have to maintain the integrity of the place. So therefore, you're going to report it as 130. Same here and same here, okay? So rounding is important. This comes, we come to the end of our section here. Um, another point to make, you probably want to go through the problems in our textbook because um, some of them will have solutions um, written down there for you so you understand the material a bit better. Um, also, the class activities help to explain the material to you as well as to your children. So it gives you a, a better handle on things. Look, look at the videos that I've included in here. Um, see which ones you find beneficial and keep a you know, running log of them so that you have resources that are at your disposal that are easily available. So that's the end of, of chapter one. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.